Well, continuing to try and catch up on commissioned reviews. I finished another book, and it is another book in the Culture series by Ian M. Banks. This is my third one of these that I have read. I am not reading them in any particular order, other than, like, this is the order that the person who's commissioning me to read them is choosing to give them to me. This time, it's Surface Detail. Um, so as I said, this is the third one. The first one that I read was Player of Games. Second one was Accession, which I liked better. And this one, I like even more. I think I can safely say that of the three I've read, this one's my favorite. I should also stress, though, uh, don't start with this one. Because it's like the other ones I've read, it it's a self-contained story. So it's not like you are dealing with established characters and you won't know what's going on or whatever. But I mean, like, this one dives so quickly into things that, like, if you don't understand the basics of how the culture works, it's not going to do as much to catch you up. And um, the, it, it helps to have some foundational understanding of how this this universe this fictional world this society actually functions and without that you, you might be a little lost but uh, i am going to try and go over some of the basics and talk about what i liked about this because i liked almost all of it like this is really well done and what it's doing is fascinating some of what it's doing is frankly existentially terrifying and it also has something that the other books have not had for me so far, but I'm going to kind of save that for the end because it's kind of my favorite thing. But this deal, well, it jumps between a number of different characters and what sort of pulls them together, not literally, actually a lot of these characters don't meet each other, but what makes them all relevant is what is going on um, for some of them in the background and for others, something they are actively involved in. And that's called the war in heaven. So I need to try and explain that. Okay, so here's the easy way to explain it, but I'm, it's going to use a point of reference. So if you don't get this, I, I will try to explain. But here's the short version. Do you know the uh, Black Mirror episode San Junipero? So you know how there's basically an art artificially created afterlife so that after people die, they can basically have their consciousness uploaded to this to exist for however long they want to do that. Okay, so imagine there's that, but then imagine also somebody made an artificial hell to put people that were deemed sinful, unworthy, bad. Stick them into that for an indefinite amount of time, theoretically, for eternity. So what the war in heaven is, is a actually a virtual war. I'll get to that bit in a second. This is kind of what I mean by like it's built on a lot of the foundational understanding of the society. But the the two sides, there's the pro hell and the anti hell side. Basically what you have is once various societies reach a level of technology that they can basically preserve a consciousness. Um and you know there's there can be a philosophical debate over whether that's a soul or not but they can preserve something of a person after the body gives out and they are able to create um you know some sort of afterlife to house that in once societies reach that level of technology some of them maybe as a carryover from uh old religious traditions and an attempt to create what they think a uh, real afterlife would have, you know, a good one or positive, or sometimes just as a threat to their society to try and keep people in line. Different different societies do it for different reasons, but they build hells. They make artificial hells to dump these consciousnesses into. And the anti-hell side says that this is barbaric because no matter what you think, this is a massive fundamental change to the concept of heaven and hell because heaven and hell, if they exist, are made by an entity beyond us doing things for reasons that we probably will not be able to fully wrap our heads around as much as we try. But when hells are built by people and those people are deciding who goes to them, that's 
terrifying. And make no mistake, we see some of these hells, and they are harrowing the glimpses that we get. It it manages to be in some ways exactly what you expect, but in a level of detail that just kind of makes it depressing and gross and terrifying all over again, even at a time when we're all largely desensitized to the general idea of, yeah, 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 a place of you know pain and suffering and there's demons and yeah, 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 we know all that. It taps into that, but like, it gives you all the visceral details to remind you like, oh, right. I shouldn't be desensitized to that concept because that's awful. Now, I mentioned this is actually a virtual war, which is the other really fascinating concept going on here. So these two sides, they want to have a war to decide, you know, and if the anti-hell side wins, the pro-hell side will get rid of all their hells. If the pro-hell side wins, the anti-hell side will leave them alone. Uh, and let and not do anything to try and stop them doing what they do. So a virtual war takes place in these constructed virtual virtual realities that are effectively identical to the real universe, but it prevents all of the collateral damage, all of the long term, you know, catastrophic uh, amount of damage and death caused by a real war. It all happens in a virtual setting. And that means that it can be as destructive as either side wants to make it without actually killing people for real. So, and like, obviously both sides have to agree in advance, like these, this is the rules of engagement. We're engaging in this virtual war. And if you win, this happens. And if we win, this happens. So all of that is going around, going on in the background of this. And as I said, we've got, I think, about five different um, main characters that we follow. There is uh, the toy. I, the, my pronunciation is based off the audiobook, which is uh, how I read this, because ADHD, it's a lot easier. So there's the toy, who is uh, an actual fighter uh, on the anti-hell side, of things and he hmm, they do a thing with him where he whenever he dies because he dies a lot his consciousness he is basically taken as a learning experience that same consciousness is just put back into fighting again on a different front with different technologies under different circumstances because this this um virtual war is happening on so many different plants on so many different fronts using so many different levels of technologies. It's a completely different experience for him every time. So through him, we kind of get the soldier's viewpoint several times of several very different situations because as I said, he keeps dying. There is Yaim, uh, who is kind of, uh, she is she's involved in an in a aspect of the culture called Quietus, uh, which I don't, know if it shows up in other books i haven't encountered it before um and it kind of it basically deals with the dead because as noted at this point there's a technology level where you somebody has to actually care for the dead so that's sort of where she's at uh there is che and prin who are two people who have actually gone to a hell voluntarily to try and document what goes on there to try and drum up um, basically a, a protest movement. Because there's some people who think, oh, the hells aren't real. That's just something that they tell us. And so uh, you have you have Che and Prin, um, and it opens with them in a hell, and things you know go a certain way from them. So it's through them that we get the really close look at what these places are like. Uh, there is, I would say, arguably the primary protagonist of the story, who is Ledeger. Uh, Ledeger is, oh boy, this stuff is, like, it's really well explained in the book. So me saying it's hard to explain, it's hard to explain in a reasonable amount of time for the purpose of a video. She's effectively an indentured servant um, with this deeply intricate tattoo that basically extends down to the molecular level and is a... Uh, is a living debt. Um, her family was indebted to uh, the other primary guy who we're going to get to in a second. 
And she was basically given over to pay that debt. And she, uh, this isn't really a spoiler because it happens very early on. Uh, she gets murdered. But then because of a neural lace in her head, which is a bit of culture tech, which her world is not supposed to have. They're not at that level of technology, so it shouldn't be there. And she didn't even know it was there. But because it's there, she is, her consciousness is preserved and she is what's called revented into a new body um, to then figure out what she wants to do. And largely her mind is on revenge and the revenge being against a man named Vepers. And Vepers is definitely if we're taking the perspective that Ledger is the primary protagonist, Vepers is the villain. And he is a really good villain. He is so perfectly loathsome. He is an atrocious human being in a way that is unsettlingly human. What I mean by that is he is the richest man in the society and on the planet in which he lives. And that makes him untouchable. And he knows it. And his arrogance. And the fact that so far through his life, he's been right. That he's just going to win. And this presumption on his part, that it's because he's somehow inherently better than everybody else. As opposed to the fact that he's just so cushioned by his wealth and his and the amount of power he has literally because you remember how i said ledger would really like revenge and would like to kill him well there's certain functions within the culture that want to prevent her from doing that even though this society that ledger and uh vepers come from like this is not something that they should be worried about but he is so powerful and in a roundabout way that gets explained later on, is kind of tied into what's going on with the war in heaven. Simply because he's so powerful, the culture may not allow Ledger to seek revenge on him because him dying is too big a domino to fall. So because he has so much money, it literally makes him untouchable. He is so loathsome. But as I said, in a way that feels very easy to recognize, in a lot of the super rich with just the air of everybody wants a piece of me. I'm better than all of you. And the fact that I'm rich is the proof of that. He, but like usually when you get a character like that, they're like sniveling little snot nose, like these sort of exaggerated sort of um, trust fun kind of characters. He's not that like he is, he is not an idiot. He is insanely arrogant, but he's not an idiot. He does know how to run his business. He does know how to put himself in a good position, but he's also not the super genius, better than everyone in the room that he thinks he is, that he assumes he is, and that the world keeps telling him he is because it keeps rewarding him by virtue of the fact that he already has all the money. <laughs> You can hear it in my voice. He is, oh, he's really good as a villain. He's really good. Um, and there's like, there's a whole bunch of other characters as well who are pretty interesting. But that's the th the other thing that I mentioned that like something I've missed from the other uh, books. I really loved some of these characters. And not like I've disliked uh, too many of the characters in the other books, but rather the other books, what generally latches on to me is the concepts, is the settings. But a lot of the individual characters, they don't stick that well. There haven't been any characters where I'm like, I love this character with, you know, for not for more than like a little bit. Like I've liked some groups. I liked the affront in uh accession i found them actually quite quite entertaining but like that kind of thing doesn't really happy for me and happen for me with this series i'll tell you who i love though i love demison and <laughs> and the ship that he is an avatar for uh the uh, outside the normal moral constraints is the name of the ship um so as a ship's avatar he's basically just a walking in, uh, extension of the uh, the AI 
that runs the ship. Demison is just an absolutely magnificent bastard. I love him so much. He is so cocky and so callous, but it just has so much fun doing, well, his job, but also whatever he feels like doing in the moment. He's just going to do his own thing. And if you're lucky, maybe he'll explain to you what it is. But he is just such an arrogant ass, but it's balanced just right where I have so much fun with him. Because unlike, say, Vepers, who is also an arrogant ass, but it's like, you don't deserve anything that you have, Demison demonstrates on a regular basis that his arrogance is very well earned um, and not and not misplaced, but oh my God, he's such a prick. And I, it can, it can be really hard to balance these characters like that, but he's so good. I love him so much. Uh, I, I have not had anyone who I was like, this is my favorite character. Like he's easily, easily my favorite character in this or any of the culture books. Oh, he's great. He's such a dick. <laughs> I like, it's not even worth trying to explain it, but if, if you read it, you'll get it. But this, this book does an insanely good job of balancing its different stories and jumping from one to the others at the right points and having each of them give just enough that you understand why it's there. Because I've, I've had some instances with some of the other books where there are characters who I'm like, I'm not entirely sure why that's there, why that subplot is there. Um, I can't think of the name now, but there was a... Um, there was a character who was like a party girl who had her face changed to look like somebody else in accession. I don't remember her name and I don't and I don't think I ever fully understood why the character was there. But like here all of these characters, all these perspective characters I'm like this adds to my understanding of the of not just like the culture and this world and but the situation going on. That this adds to my understanding to the hells as they exist, the the war about them, the people who are not directly involved in the war but have a vested interest in the outcome, and the effects on people who don't even know it's going on or it has no direct impact on them, but it's still so far reaching that it impacts them anyways. It's all really well balanced. And it again, what I really love about something like this and I felt this way about Accession as well. Um, player of games somewhat, but these other two much more. This is a story you couldn't tell with any genre other than science fiction. And that's something I deeply love. I don't necessarily have a problem with the story where the sci-fi is largely an aesthetic, which, to take an example, Star Wars. Star Wars is a warm movie and kind of a knight errant you know, kind of kind of story. You could re, you could take the basic skeleton of Star Wars, put it in a f purely fantasy setting, and effectively nothing other than the aesthetic changes. You know, instead of lightsabers, it's broadswords, and and you know, and and that sort of thing. It it tra it could transfer to somewhere else. What I love about this, uh, the both this and Accession, but I think this one even more so than Accession. This is dealing with concepts that don't transfer to any other genre. These are ideas that can only be done in sci-fi. The ideas of the artificial hells, the ideas of a virtual war, the way the technology is being used in various ways, the way that certain ancient technology is being used in a way to try and mask other stuff going on. Like the, all of these concepts are fully Fully sci-fi. You couldn't tell this story in any other genre. And I love something that can embrace what it is so fully that you can't get this kind of story somewhere else. And that that is what surface detail gives me. This was really good. It was deep. It was dense. It was long. It was dang long. But I really liked this book. Like, I I thought Player of Games was pretty good, and I did like Accession, but I really, really like Surface Detail. Have you read this one? 
what do you think of it in relation to other culture books, just as a sci-fi story in general? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon was how I was commissioned to read this really good book. Uh, if you want to commission me to review stuff, you can do that there. Or if you want to support me just at any level, as little as a dollar a month, you still get perks for that. And I super appreciate it. But even if you can't, what I really want you to remember is that we take a relaxed attitude around here so you don't have to worry about it. Just come on back next time you need a break. Time to give my thanks to my highest supporting patrons. That would include Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfullah, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Oliver B, Melinda Walters, Imu Delki, Theotha Boyd, Becky Sparks, Pranabi Likes the Poodle, Zach, Idolin, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Adam RDL Taylor, Shane Ross, Shaley Gourlay, Brendan LaRose, and TT. <laughs> if you want your name said, while these guys try and distract me, consider looking at the rewards of my Patreon. 